Of all the major franchises that have captivated gamers over the years that I never got around to playing, despite having friends and family rave about just how amazing it is and have forums, web pages, and comment sections mentioned in such high and consistent regards, is the Mass Effect trilogy. In my later teens, there were many a times I had found myself simply listening and nodding along as friends discussed a hard decision they had to make, a romantic option, or a side quest that was particularly memorable, and have zero idea as to what exactly was being discussed. It would take someone to mention the name Shepard for you to click that it was in fact Mass Effect, and feeling a smidge of guilt for that being all I really knew about the franchise. After years of that, I would eventually buy the game digitally, thanks to some super cheap sale that Xbox was running, and try to see just what all the ruckus was about. The first time I tried to play it, I finished the first few missions in the main quest, but put it down for the night, not knowing that it would be the last time I tried for yet another couple years. And for the time, I can remember thinking that the small bit that I played was certainly intriguing, but just wasn't able to get into it due to how dated it felt. I generally don't have a big issue in playing older games, but there was just a little too much jank to Mass Effect for my liking. After that, I would go on to still feel guilty about not really getting into the franchise, swearing to myself and promising friends that I would eventually give Mass Effect another shot. Then, on November 7th, 2020, EA announced that BioWare would be releasing Mass Effect Legendary Edition, a 4K remaster of the original trilogy that would feature all the DLC and quality of life changes that would help the original feel more on par with its later entries. I saw that announcement and knew that it was finally my time. I knew right then and there that I was finally going to play through one of the most revered RPG franchises of the last 20 years and finally be able to join in on the discussion. And along with that was yet another major revelation. With its announcement came a flood of other games and content creators who have also not had the chance to play this supposedly great trilogy, and I saw an opportunity. Though those who clicked on this video may have expected this to be a simple critique of how the games look now as opposed to how they did 9 plus years ago, and the small tweaks they made to modernize the games. Instead, this review is going to be from the perspective of someone who has never played a Mass Effect title from start to finish until this collection, to those who have also never played through the series. So now, without further ado, let's hop into the review of the Mass Effect Legendary Edition. Set more than 100 years in the future, Mass Effect follows humanity 30 years after they found ancient alien artifacts that greatly advances human technology to the point that they achieve intergalactic travel. The discovery of intergalactic travel then puts humans in contact with several other alien species that have for thousands of years known of and governed over each other and the galaxy at large. You play as Commander Shepard, a seasoned war veteran of your creation, and are sent to the planet Eden Prime to investigate an alleged attack on an excavation site where Prothean artifacts Protheans being the extinct ancient aliens that pioneered space travel and other advanced technologies have been found. When you land, things prove to be awry and quickly go from bad to worse as one of your crew is killed, a member of the Special Tactics and Reconnaissance, Spectre for short, who is sent to watch over your mission is double-crossed by another member known as Saren and is killed, and learn that evil alien robots known as the Geth are killing innocent colonists in search for what the dig site has found. Once you learn of the betrayal, defeat the Geth, and find the artifact in which Shepard has a rather unique interaction with, you travel off-world to the Citadel, a giant hub where various alien species live, to inform the Council, a board of representatives for the most powerful and respected species, of what all happened on Eden Prime. Though the conversation with the Council doesn't exactly go as planned, you are granted the status of Spectre, a first for any human, and are given the go-ahead to try and prove Saren's nefarious deeds and bring him to justice. However, once you investigate just what it is Saren's up to, you learn that he's under the indoctrination of a collective of giant robots known as the Reapers, who plan to eradicate all advanced civilizations and must race to find a way to prevent that from happening. Believe me when I say that this is a very anemic retelling of the events of this title, and though that description may lead you to think that this is a simple and generic race against time sort of fair, the mostly stellar writing packs enough twists and turns that keep the trope fresh and far away from falling into that pit. While on the topic of the writing, the standout in the first Mass Effect is its world building, particularly in the relations among the aliens. Throughout your playthrough, you learn about the various species and both their histories and relations among one another, which are all sort of tumultuous at best. You'll see just what I mean once you learn about how most people feel about the Krogan. This point actually further extends to your squad mates as you recruit them. Most of the characters are very well written and offer a different perspective on your mission through the galaxy. This is made all the better with the excellent voice acting which includes the likes of Keith David, who gives Admiral Anderson a stern, yet caring cadence, or the casual, full-hearted delivery from Seth Green for Joker. Another feat that the writing pulls off is that never does it feel overly expository, which is definitely 
definitely a win when it comes to the combination of science fiction and RPG. And while yes, most RPGs allow for players to seek out more information, whether it be through dialogue options or journal system, the codex here, even with the framing of humans being relatively new to everything going on in the galaxy, never did I feel like I was being treated unintelligently by the writers here. Decision making is another huge part here in the original and throughout the entire trilogy, and honestly, I have to say that Bioware has on display some of the most meaningful choice making. Not only are some of the repercussions of your actions seen through the game you make them in, but some even have lasting consequences in the entire series if you choose to transfer your character from title to title. That was something that I found deeply admirable as it truly made my choices feel important to the overall narrative. All is not perfect however, as I feel that Bioware handles certain themes rather wonkily. While yes, I think that topics like genocide and racism and such definitely lend themselves rather well to the medium and genre, and I'm glad that Bioware did try to tackle them, especially back in 07. When it comes to the latter of these two themes, however, more often than not, it leaves Shepard coming off as this weird great mediator of alien race-based relations that would trigger my partner and I trading jokes about how Shepard ends racism due to the writing's occasionally awkward handling of it. This is actually an issue that recurs throughout the series, so be prepared for that. Where the writing does falter severely though, and I know I'm going to take quite a bit of flack for it because it's been something that I've heard held in high regard over the years, is the writing around romance in the original. My character was straight and male, and boy let me tell you you the writing around the romanceable female characters was dated at best, problematic at worst. With this clip, I want you to keep a couple things in mind. One, this is barely after the first couple of main quests, and two, Ashley, the character you're about to see, is from a family of military service people. If you expect to get me in a tinfoil miniskirt and thigh-high boots, I want dinner first. I don't know about you, but the fact that one of the first major hints that she's romanceable was just a little strange to me. Especially since you are a higher ranking officer, it just seemed rather unfitting and awkward for that character. The worst offense, however, has to go to the infamous Liar Tassali, the Asari that sparked quite a bit of a stir in the real world. Though unfortunately I don't have the moment captured, there is a scene in which after you rescue Liara, you and your crew talk with her back on the Normandy, which leads to her age being brought up due to how the Asari do so remarkably slower than humans. Though it's revealed that she's over 100 years old, she goes on to state that among the Asari people, she's barely considered more than a child. You want to explain to me what you're doing here? And while yes, she's over 106, there's something about a romanceable character being described as barely considered more than a child that rubs me the wrongest way. Moving on to gameplay in Mass Effect, the core experience is a third person cover based squad shooter. Before each mission, you choose two other squad mates to accompany Shepard, and each character has different strengths and abilities to bring to a fight. You go against waves of enemy AI as you progress through a level and use your typical range of firearms. Assault rifles, shotguns, sniper rifles, pistols, you know the like. Weapons also don't actually run out of ammo ever, instead just overheating if they're used too much. There is also a mod system in which you find various weapon attachments such as rounds that do different status effects will allow for more rounds to be shot before overheating. It's also worth mentioning that at any time you can change out weapons, attachments, and armors for you and your squad mates. Along with weapons, Mass Effect includes special powers known as Biotics and Tech. Biotics make use of the franchise's titular Mass Effect field to conjure powerful abilities such as being able to throw enemies through the air or turn invisible, while Tech allows for you to hack synthetic enemies and summon AI-controlled turrets. I can't really speak on how I enjoyed them in the first game since the class that I chose didn't have either, but commanding my squad mates to use theirs would really help turn the tide of the fight. And being an RPG, we gotta talk about the leveling system. Again, depending on what class you choose, you get a list of abilities and skills you can upgrade each time you and your chosen squad mates level up. And once you completely level up the class specific trait, you determine a specialization that unlocks even more abilities for you to learn. But how exactly does it all come together in terms of actual enjoyability? When action does kick off, well, unfortunately, even with the quality of life changes to things like weapon accuracy, changes to the cover system and such, the general gameplay is still on the side of wonky. Gunplay feels bland and boring in spite of weapon modifications, and overall difficulty just wasn't really there. Mission variety is particularly non-existent, as a majority of them have you running through, taking cover from fire, then returning fire until you move on to the next section, with the only break in monotony being the Mako missions, which when you aren't exploring planets, just recycles the gameplay loop, but on four wheels. Enemies were more of bullet sponges and actually challenging as both enemy and your squad AI is not very good. 
There were times that enemies would stand staring at nothing as I shot at them, or my squad would run around or just stand in the open in the middle of a firefight. What I will absolutely praise though is the locales and vistas on the varying planets you explore, which can be rather breathtaking thanks to the 4K enhancements. Again, this isn't a review of the graphical improvements that were a huge draw to the Legendary Edition, but I will round off each section with 4K screenshots I got while playing on the One X to show off how great the games do look for those who are curious. Here were a few of my favorites by the time the credits rolled. Mass Effect 2 starts with Shepard and the Normandy traveling through space to intervene in an incident with the Geth when the ship is suddenly attacked. The Normandy is destroyed and Shepard is blown into space and dies from the conditions of the Great Vacuum. The story is not over for Shepard, however, as her body is recovered by Cerberus, a human interest terrorist group who attempt to bring them back to life in an experiment known as the Lazarus Project. Two years come to pass and Shepard awakens in a laboratory that's under attack by its own security bots, and escapes with the help of a Cerberus operative named Miranda and Jacob, a mercenary the group has paid service for. Upon escaping, Shepard speaks to the head of Cerberus, a mysterious and shadow individual known as the Elusive Man, who informs Shepard that human colonies throughout the galaxy are being attacked and the people abducted by a race of aliens long thought to be a myth known as the Collectors, and are working in part with the Reapers, and ask for you to help with Cerberus in assembling a team and stopping the abductions. Look, I'll be honest, though I really did like the first Mass Effect, the fact that humans were essentially the big saviors of the galaxy, with most of the praise going to Shepard very specifically, wasn't exactly my cup of tea. You had a sizable squad of aliens united, yet the praise fell solely on Shepard. Mass Effect 2 writes that pet peeve and came off as a way more enjoyable narrative since not only do you work for this questionable organization, you essentially have to convince those you help and need help from that you are in fact the good guy. It's a smart and incredibly refreshing take from the first, even if it comes to bite the series later on. You'll see what I'm talking about once I get the three. The writing is yet again at center stage here, and it does a great job of making you care about a mostly new cast of characters, as well as deepening and complicating the relationships you maintained in the previous entry, though there are some issues nonetheless. Aside from Shepard solving racism again, there was a bit of trouble with the autism representation that's just a bit dated, specifically in the Overlord DLC. Though the overall experience is damning the treatment of a character's autistic brother, and does well at portraying how some people on the spectrum do have special interests, the major fault I had with it is the whole concept, and to avoid spoilers of the DLC, it's how it likens the character to robots and machines. It's an outdated trope and stereotype, but understandably more progressive for the time. It's just awkward in 2021. What's really different this time around is the gameplay. Though still very much a cover-based squad shooter like the original, BioWare this time around was able to create a much more enjoyable experience. And though it still has its issues, as often I find myself just a bit too stuck to cover, and AI is still as dumb as bricks occasionally, I found it to be a more enjoyable experience compared to its predecessor. One big point I want to address is the variety this time around, particularly the new loyalty missions. Thanks to the loyalty missions, some much needed change comes about as one mission may have you completing a handful of objectives while undercover at a party before ending in a boss fight with an osprey, while another may find you walking through the rafters as you follow a politician who's moments away from being assassinated. Though I mentioned that decision making is highly important in the original section, in Mass Effect 2, Bioware introduces a system known as Paragon and Renegade actions. Paragon and Renegade are also in the original as they are the spectrums of the morality system, with the former being the more heroic choices and the latter being the edgier or straight up meaner choices. And while before this was just boiled down to dialogue options. In the sequel, and moving forward, there would be moments during cutscenes in which, depending on what's going on, will allow for you to commit an action that falls under one of the categories. For example, one scene would allow for a paragon action that may have you shouting over someone and giving a riveting speech that convinces them to see things your way, while a renegade action might see you stabbing someone in the back with an electric rod to create an escape opportunity for later in the mission. These actions are also completely optional, but doing so gives you a significant boost in the rating 
reading of whichever you choose. And while I thought they were gimmicky at first, I found them to be character defining moments as I played more, further adding depth to the kind of character you want your shepherd to be. A big change to the gameplay is the removal of the ability to change weapons or mods anytime in combat. In the original you could do this on the fly, but this time around you have to do so before the start of each mission, and cannot swap unless there is a weapon locker. I actually really like this change, as it makes you consider the weapons you want to take out per mission. It makes outfitting yourself and your squad feel far more important. Guns also now have roles, meaning that certain firearms will be better in fights than others. For example, machine pistols, a new weapon type to the series, will tear through biotic barriers and shields, but are weak to armor, while heavy pistols are the opposite. Along with machine pistols, heavy weapons are now an option, and are meant to take down the harder targets you come across. Ammo is also limited for these weapons as a way to ensure the player isn't essentially running through missions propelling rockets or black holes at everything that moves. Also ammo in general is a thing now, which honestly is for the best. Having actually played a character with biotic abilities this time around, I can now say that I enjoyed them quite a bit. Having chosen Vanguard for my playthrough, I had Cryo and Incendiary rounds, which either burns your enemies to a crisp or freezes them in place, Charge, which propelled me violently toward an enemy with the full force of my shepherd's body and then some, and my favorite, Shockwave, which is a large rolled wave that climbs up walls and over cover to send everyone in its way flying to various directions. And though of course starting out they weren't too powerful, I still found myself able to use them in the early game to get out of hairy situations. Toward mid and late game, however, after focusing on leveling them up, they do become incredibly powerful and do great deals of damage, even against tougher enemies you face in the later hours. Crafting is also a big feature in the game as you can create armor sets, weapon, and ship upgrades. Though it's not the most in-depth system, as it's largely just collecting X amount of materials through each level or by mining planets, then go into a menu and confirm your upgrade, it is actually very important to do so. You can also buy new weapons and armor if you don't want to spend too much time mining planets. The only complaint I have are with the ship upgrades since they require a lot of materials to make, but don't become of actual importance until the end. Mass Effect 2 is the best possible sequel that this series could have gotten. It took what made the original great, such as the writing, storytelling, world building, and doubled down on deepening the world players cared about while also raising the stakes. Gameplay, though having its own issues, is also generally a much better experience this time around by adding meaningful depth to its combat and core gameplay. It all came together to deliver a much more realized entry in the series. To round off before moving into 3, here are some of my favorite images that I took in game. Mass Effect 3 is the grand conclusion to the original trilogy and marks an end to Shepard's story. Taking place six months after the events of Mass Effect 2, Shepard is now relieved of duty and has been under surveillance by the Alliance military back on Earth due to their connection to Cerberus in the prior entry. That changes rather quickly as Earth is then invaded by the Reapers, the giant species-ending robots whose plans you've been trying to thwart over the past two games. After being reinstated to the military, you learn that the entire galaxy is under siege by their destructive entities. To prevent the galaxy from being destroyed, Shepard must now race to assemble a team one final time, convince the alien species to all come together and put an end to the Reaper threat once and for all. And while the general storytelling, like the previous entries, is still rather well done, admittedly, the story itself isn't quite on par with its predecessors. Having to rally the various species to fight on your side this time around doesn't have the same effect like it did in the prior games, largely because it's mostly impersonal. Mass Effect 2 had the advantage of you seeking out an individual, then doing them a favor in order to gain their trust that more than not resulted in a deeper connection and understanding of the character, and 3 how However, though at some point you're pulling off great feats of heroism, it doesn't carry the same weight, except in a few cases that involve reoccurring characters. There's also less recruitable characters this time around too with only one of them outside of DLC being entirely new. And while most of the new characters throughout the series ended up being pretty interesting and well written, James comes off as the generic soldier type and looks like a cheap off-brand Amos from The Expanse. Mass Effect 3 also feels like it's grasping at straws that further complicate the journey for Shepard. Well yes, a lot of the different species have great conflicts amongst themselves through the games, but the arrival of a much larger threat that can literally eradicate every single species there is, it's hard to suspend belief that they don't 
don't take priority over some of the squabbles. The point actually goes further to how people react to Shepard previously being allied with Cerberus. When talking about Mass Effect 2, I said that I really like the fact that people are more cautious to Shepard due to their connection with the terrorist group. In the context of the game, it made sense for people to be wary of your actions. But with the conclusion of 2, and at least with the choices that I made, it's just frustrating from a narrative standpoint for that to be a point of contention towards you despite the fact that you've literally saved the galaxy twice. It just seemed like an unnecessary point of conflict. Another big issue I had was that certain characters also begin to act in ways that they hadn't before in the series, and in my opinion, seem to do so simply for the sake of the plot, rather than because of any sort of development we'd seen in previous entries, which is yet another storytelling pet peeve of mine. Give these characters the proper motivations to do the things that they do, not give little to no motivation or explanation for their actions, that's just lazy storytelling. Mass Effect 3 builds further off the two, getting closer to your average cover base shooter, from finally not so sticky walls to less tankish movement, even adding a roll mechanic that is way more sensitive than I'd prefer, often leading me to randomly roll when I was trying to instead sprint, but not too terribly annoying. Leveling has also been revisited this time around, as traits now, after an initially linear path of buffs, comes to a split, in which you choose one or the other depending on how you wish to specialize a certain perk or ability. This sort of flexibility seems to allow for varying skill and class builds that can make a character lean more support based or power based, which I actually really liked. Mission variety has unfortunately reverted back to being rather samey. When it does try to mix things up from the now series familiar walk here, shoot these people, move on to the next area gameplay loop, it's either withhold this objective for a certain amount of time in turn sections, but neither of these really do anything to break up the monotonous gameplay, especially since those two are outdated even by 2012 standards. An odd change they added this time around is that weapons now have weight to them and carrying either a lot or a little affects your biotic usage. I guess this was a way of Bioware trying to nerf players having more powerful weapons and biotics, but why? Why not allow players to use whichever they want in whatever combat scenario? Why add a totally unnecessary mechanic to try and push players to one play style over the other? It just didn't make any sort of sense to me. Lastly, and equally unnecessary, is the removal of crafting and planet mining like there was in the previous century. Though admittedly crafting wasn't the absolute best in two, often requiring high amounts of materials for upgrades, I think it should have been tweaked to require less or just finer tuned in general rather than removed entirely. My guess is that it may have been done to to refocus on weapon attachments or outright buying weapons instead of making and upgrading them, but it just comes off as yet another unneeded change. And with that, I end the Mass Effect 3 section. So here are some of the cool shots I got while playing the third entry. Now it's time for the big question. How do I feel about the trilogy as a whole now that I've played through all of the main entries? All these years of wanting to delve into this hugely popular franchise, didn't meet the hype surrounding it when the credits rolled for the final time. Honestly, I can easily say that I enjoyed the Mass Effect trilogy and see how it's remained one of the most beloved RPGs of all time. Though yeah, there was definitely some serious jank, and gameplay never felt the absolute best, always gradually improving but never really getting to that totally enjoyable mark. The journey of the trilogy from start to finish was one that I had a lot of fun with. Mass Effect invited me into this brilliant, meticulously crafted universe, gave me unique and diverse characters to care for and form relationships with, and introduced me to a deep and mostly consistent and dammitly enjoyable story, all the makings of a great game and managed to do that for the majority of a trilogy. If you're like me and haven't played Mass Effect prior to the Legendary Edition, I really do recommend buying it to experience the franchise presented at the best it has ever been. This has been Waxo, and until next time, take it easy.